Yes. Um, why do you think that the left is so self-loathing and self-attacking and um, self-destructive towards their and our interests? That's a very, very, very good question. Why is the left so alienated? Why is their public policy and political philosophy so different from conservatives? And as conservatives, you must think about that. Look, Aristotle and Plato had their fights. Rousseau and Locke had theirs, right? Rousseau turned his own children into the orphanage, never to see them again, because the state knew better how to raise them. Whereas Locke became the philosopher of the American founding, and in his two treaties on government said, private property, self-rule, checks and balances. So there were conservatives and leftists even then and all along. It's a religious divide. The left is prophetic. They believe in bringing heaven down to earth now, right? And they'll cram it down your throat if they have to. And I don't care how bloody it is with Stalin and Mao, etc., etc., or that all the evidence is in now today to the left and everybody else about what the left produces with big, gross state economies, right? Or dictatorships, or state rule, or the nanny state. Do Californians need more evidence about what the Democrat legislature and their public employee unions will do? The Stanford study right nearby, half a trillion dollars in unfunded liabilities. Every one of your kids and grandkids is being left an unbelievable bill that we can't pay. Everybody knows all this, but the left doesn't want to learn. The left doesn't want to learn. Maybe some in the center go out and get them for November. Move them over our way. There are still rational, I hope, centrists and independents and Democrats. Let's get them. This is the time to unify. The primary is over. Let's go win in November. But the left, philosophically, is resistant to the evidence. There's no amount of information about Stalin to get the people who are still alive today who apologize for him. Do you know that? To admit they were wrong. The ideology, the dream. Teddy Kennedy's the dream shall never die. Live your dreams at home with your family and your church and your synagogue. But for public policy, conservatives ask a second question. Not just who cares, which is the Democratic Party slogan. We care, we care, we care. We ask a second question. What works? How's it going, Detroit? Chicago? Sacramento? Right? We ask the second question, what works? We care too. We care enough to ask what works and not just be, this is the point, not just be feeling good because I pull the lever for the party that says we care, so aren't I a great person? I care, I care, I care. So, in other words, you don't get them either. <laughs> I don't get them either, no. <laughs> yes, sir. How are you doing? Uh, How are you doing? Well, there was good news last week when Zucker was fired from NBC and also Klein was canned from CNN. What I like, you know, I'm not wealthy, but why don't conservatives create a newspaper in San Jose? To counter San Jose Heartbreaking and the San Rico Chronicles. So, Good question about the media. It seems to me we're doing that. And by the way, there's no barrier to entry, and your leadership would be incredibly warmly welcome. It's called the internet. It's called the internet. And people are getting their news now online. You see the collapsing market share, right? Both of the big three, ABC, CBS, and NBC. And of the newspapers, does anybody pick up any more daily than New York? Blair Times? No. Their leverage is going way, way down, and it's a great thing. And so this is correct question. We are doing it. And you should network and build. Do you have a website for this group? Okay, you all go to the website. Do you submit articles on it? Do you think a community? What are you doing between now and Election Day, and then beyond that, to bring more people in here? Next time I come back, if you'll have me back in a year or two, let's double it. And look what you've already done. So I am your partner in this, and together we'll make all the difference in the world. Meg Whitman, I, I do some policy advice for her as well. She told me the other day, she did her round of media interviews. She said to me, off the record, but no one will repeat anything, right? <laughs> she said, you sit in those editorial board meetings, and you're polite, and you answer all the questions. And she really is, at this point, very well informed on all the issues. A really solid thinker about California's problems, the economy and jobs, and focus like a laser beam. And she said, you can see their eyes are blazing over. 
They want to get to the gotcha question. And they sit there all arrogant, like they're the most important people in the world. The three guys who write the editorial for the LA Times, the Chronicle, and the San Jose Mercury. She said, fortunately, they don't get it. That's a dinosaur. Nobody cares as much anymore. So it's happening anyways. Yes? Um, hi. Uh, in your speech, you mentioned that, uh, uh, you mentioned something about a second revolution. I was just wondering if you were implying that we might be nearing a civil war or something. <laughs> Is it possible? <laughs> it deserves thought, that question. Are we near an American Civil War or a Second Civil War? It deserves great, honest, sober thought. Maybe nonviolently, yes. I am surprised, I am surprised in my no longer short lifetime how disunited we've become how the two polar opposite worldviews are so clearly defined, how 90-something percent of the academics in this country in the soft sciences, English, archaeology, history, psychology, right, anthropology, are perfectly content to live their lives not rubbing up against ideas they don't agree with, but only with ideas they do agree with. They literally, ideologically, are willing to sacrifice their good name. In the United States of America in 2010, the best and the brightest, although they're not, of course, but they think they are, the academics of this country don't demand of themselves fair and honorable debate, do beat up kids who are afraid to speak up their mind. Is that not violence? Is the incredible thievery against the American people in your taxes from accounts receivable? all the way through to Z, from A to Z. How much money do you want out of my wallet for my work day? You want 50%? You want 60? You want 70? You want 80 by the time you're done with real estate taxes and sales taxes? And now you're proposing a VAT tax? Not to replace the income tax, it will be in addition to it, as it is in Europe and Canada. An extra 20 cents out of every dollar every time you buy something at the store just to feed the elites? How much more do you want? before the American people fight back. Now, we'll fight back non-violently. I certainly hope so. But we're fighting back. Yeah. We're fighting back. And that's what this election's about. That's what the Tea Party's all about. <laughs> Whether it's the second American Revolution, what was the first revolution all about? As Dennis Miller put it, they taxed our breakfast beverage too highly. <laughs> We had a revolution over that. Okay, and a whole lot more. Something about a king. Stand back and liberty. But I know what's going on out there. I'm you, and you're me. I know what's going on out there. It is boiling over. Now we're going to throw them out, and we're actually going to prevent, we're going to prevent the boiling over of the kettle. Because we're going to exercise our rights in a democracy peacefully, and we're going to take back the people's house. Yes.